What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Unconventional Money Moves Podcast. I got Bill Lennon with us here today. And Bill was raised a little bit different. He didn't live on the mainland. He lived in the islands. He said before we hopped on here, he lived in the Philippines, Guam, Hawaii. And he's taken what he's learned from those cultures and translated that to the tech space where he's worked at, worked at companies such as Google, Walmart. And Bill's specialty is building teams and leading them to success. And he's the founder of 40% Better. Why Why 40% Better? Where, where in the heck does that random number come from, Bill? And I uh, appreciate having you on. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the thanks for the opportunity. So um, there's a story behind every company name, right? Just like your 369 has a story. So 40% Better happened because I, a few years ago, um, I, I, I went to work at a company um, I was a team lead for the software, one of their software teams, and my onboarding happened with the CEO, the CTO, and at the very end of the onboarding, he said, uh, kind of sheepishly, by the way, I'm giving you the worst performing software team in our company. Um, they've been together for at least eight years, some of them longer. Their performance isn't very good. Um, we've done everything we can to improve it, and it hasn't helped their performance or their attitudes. And I said, okay, thank you, sir. I appreciate the heads up. And I walked out thinking, well, this is going to be a challenge. Um, six months later, I go into the office like I normally do. And he walks over and says, hey, Bill, can I talk to you for a few minutes? And I go, yeah, sure. What, what's up? And I go into his office and he closes the door and turns around and goes, what have you done to your team? And I said, um, I, I, I don't know. What, what are you talking about? And he goes, I gave you the worst performing team in the company. You now have the best performing team in the company. Their attitudes are so much better. And they're, they're producing 40% more code than they were when you got them. I don't know how to do this. What's going on? And I said, well, um, I take really good care of my teams. Because at the time, I didn't know how to explain what I was doing. And he said, well can you teach me what you're doing? And I said, well, I, I, I don't know, I know. And he said, well, when you figure out how to, I wanna learn. And I said, cause he said, I can't do this. And I said, okay, great, no problem. I, and so that always stuck in my head. And uh, when we were thinking about names for this leadership program, that, that was the, the obvious winner. Yeah, well, like, wasn't the point of bringing you on so he didn't have to do it? <laughs> Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's crazy how you can get a change of scenery. Like in sports, they'll bring in a new coach. I remember in 2002, when I was growing up, the Buccaneers, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, got rid of Tony Dungy and brought in John Gruden, then won the Super Bowl. Tony Gr Dungy was a great coach, but they just changed the coach, same team, same building yeah. blocks, changed the coach, won a Super Bowl. So, I mean, bringing right, in a right. different, different voice, a different attitude is – definitely could be detrimental or beneficial to a, a team. Right, right. And does that outlook come from your island experience living on beautiful places such as Hawaii? Um, part of it does, yeah. I think I think part of that, that background, it, it, it's a very different cultural experience to live in those kinds of places um, because the people around you, for the most part, don't have the experience of growing up here on the mainland in the contiguous... 48. And so there's a very different culture of cultural appreciation. And, and it's normal to be in a place where you've got all these, this mix of culture. Um, and that just changes how I think about interacting with my team. Like I really appreciate all the different perspectives everybody has. And I want to get more from them. Right. Like, I don't want them to feel like they have to be quieter because they didn't grow up in, you know, in West Coast California culture. Right. Or mm -hmm. wherever it happens to be. Yeah, yeah. You have to treat everyone differently. Just like if you have. Yeah. I mean, do you have multiple? Do you have any kids? I do have two. Yeah. I have two. Yeah. Sons. They're probably, you know. They're both yours, but they're both very different. And exactly on a yeah. team, it, they all could be. Uh, it sounds like you're working with software engineers. Yep. Yep. So you know they're all software engineers, but they're all different. 
There are yeah. all yeah. different kinds of people, and you have to know how to coach different people. You can't just coach the team unilaterally across the board. Right, right. It's it's very much an individual. It's an individual effort, right? It, and and one of the things I had to realize was there is no horizontal scalability because everybody's different, right? And the 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 thing that I might need to coach you about for somebody else would be com completely irrelevant, right? It wouldn't make sense at all. And the thing that they really need help with for you might be super easy and you'd be like, why are you coaching me on this, right? And so you know, that was one of the things I had to learn early on was that everybody needs different kinds of um, of handholding. Um, and that really, you know, my job as a team lead is to help them all operate better. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that better is different for every person. And, and, uh, and so, you know, so I've got to be willing to be, to be non-scalable and, um, and differently focused depending on who it is I'm working with. Yeah. You almost have to be a chameleon changing your colors. Oh, totally depending yeah. on who you're talking to. And it doesn't sound like this is something anyone taught you. It was just almost innate. It's like a skill you can't even explain to someone. You're like, I just know how to do this. So, yeah, so it sounds like that, but the reality, like everything else is, it's it's because of things I learned growing up. So the first, the first piece of it was, and the reason that I lived in all these strange places is my dad was in the military. And he ran supply chains in the Air Force. Um, his teams loaded bombs and bullets onto airplanes and managed all of them. And he always said that the only reason he was successful was because his teams operated really well together. And that his job was to remove all the friction and to make it as easy as possible for them to operate well. And so that was a really good founding principle. And then... When I, when I was in college, I worked in, in a really nice restaurant. Um, and that was a, a place where they had a very proactive coaching culture. And they said, you know, the management on day one said, if you want to get ahead here and we want you to get ahead, you need to recognize that you're going to start off not knowing anything and someone's going to coach you. And six months in, you're going to know a lot and we're going to get somebody new coming in the door and your job's going to be to coach them. And, and that's part of the value to the organization is your ability to transfer knowledge to other people and to have that internal coaching. And so the whole time I was, I was in that restaurant, I was there for a few years during college. Somebody who was more experienced than me was always coaching me at some different way along the path. And I was coaching new hires about you know about how to do this and so when when i started building software teams those models were already in my head as this is how to approach it um it's not a genetic thing it's 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 100 percent learned <laughs> yeah well it's yeah. an acquired skill yeah i remember reading or hearing somewhere someone said i don't know it was probably someone much wiser than the both of us combined. They're like an expert <laughs> teaches you how a skill the best way they know how to do it. A master teaches you a skill based on how you need to learn how to do it. And it seems like right. that's where you have separated yourself from your competition in order to build these teams, work at these large enterprises such as Google and Walmart, and eventually starting your own company 40% better. Yeah, it's, I think- there's there's you know there's multiple different things that i that i notice in the environment around you know first of all how people actually do leadership mm -hmm. um and we came up you know as as we figured out how to reverse engineer everything we were doing we realized that everything rested on these five pillars um and it's consistent across the board Right. So for us, the five pillars are communication. You got to be able to communicate effectively. Right. Um, emotional resilience, which is something I don't think people talk about enough because doing leadership well can be scary. And if you let that fear stop you, then you won't take 
good enough care of your people. And I've, I've had other peers of mine tell me to my face that there's things that I've done that they couldn't do because they were too afraid. And I'm, then I, and I like, oh, wait a minute, like this is actually, and it's a stack of skills, right? To manage your brain chemistry so that you can go do that thing that scares you. Um, the third one is your mental models. And, and we, we all operate based on our mental models. Um, and I always think about how do I upgrade my mental models and, and where do my mental models get me in trouble or scare me or block me from something. Um, and then the fourth one is power dynamics is who has power in a company. And again, one of the things I notice is people tend to dramatically underestimate the level of power they have inside a company. Um, and, and then the fifth one is habits. Like, what can I automate, right? Um, you know, in the leadership world, Jocko Willink talks about discipline equals freedom. And I believe that to a point, and then I think things become habits after that. And if you can rely on habits, you don't have to have discipline. And I think a lot of what Jocko does is by habit, not necessarily by discipline, because he has a habit of waking up early in the morning and doing a workout. I don't think he has discipline anymore because he's been doing that for decades. I think it's just his habit of the alarm went off. It's 4.30 in the morning. I'm going to go work out, right? Um, you know, for me, I don't, I don't think of that as being a, a discipline anymore. It's just, it's just automated. Yeah. Kind of a long answer to your question. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. I mean, eventually, I mean, everything's hard when you first start it. I mean, you don't start off as an expert. I mean, yeah. Tiger Woods didn't start off being a great golfer. He just put right. in more time and effort than pretty much everyone else and became the yeah. best, according to some. And when you're in a business, uh, everyone has different strengths and weaknesses, but sometimes the employees there could feel a little down on themselves because someone's getting all the recognition just because they're doing one thing really well. And sometimes they feel like they might be overlooked, whereas their skill that they're bringing to the table is still super vital, but they're maybe just not getting that recognition or that pat on the back that everyone wants. Everyone just wants to be right, recognized right. and know they're doing a good job. Not just like, Oh, I'm paying you, you know, that should be good enough. I mean, people need to hear it and know that they're valued and appreciated. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's, that's a hundred percent true. And, um, uh, Gallup has been doing these, these research projects on employees and employee satisfaction and, and they, they came up with uh, 12 things that employees want at work, years of research around this, right? One of them is acknowledgement that, uh, from the company, their leadership, that they're doing good work, right? So that's, that's totally one of the biggies. And, and I, think, I think part of the reason that my teams work so well is that I always made sure they got all the accolades and I took all the arrows. Because I, I think my job is to defend them from criticism and to f because their performance is my responsibility. And if there's criticism about their performance, that should be on me, right? Because that's my job is to make sure their performance is getting better. But if they're, if they're doing great work, then they're writing all the code because I'm not writing code, then they should get all the, all the congratulations. Uh, and, and I, I think that's one of those little pieces, right? That is, as you mentioned, it's so valuable for people. Um, even the shy ones, you know, the ones that are, that are typically quiet and kind of introverted, they still want accolades. And, and so you, you should do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you play to win the game. If you're playing video games, you yeah. want to win the game. Um, if you're, whatever you're doing, you want to win. And it's not just, you know, I'm paying you good money to be a software engineer like you should be happy yeah. enough with that because right now in that space people have lots and lots of choices especially right, right. now and companies are starting to realize that like hey like this person they could jump ship at any time and probably right. get paid more and be more appreciated yeah yeah but like yeah. a lot of people out there are just scared to jump ship because of like fear of the unknown or you know, is the grass really greener over there? Or I'm not quite sure, especially people who are a little bit more reserved and introverted. And that could be mm -hmm. scary for some people wanting to do that. And they just kind of feel like, hey, I just want to stay put, you know, put my headphones on, do my code, show up to the 
the meetings and go home. Well, yeah, it, they, not go home because they probably work from home, but like, right, right, cut the yeah. laptop off. Yeah, and it's you know the question becomes well, what you know I always ask everybody on my teams, what is it you want out of work? Where do you want your career to go? How can I help you? Hmm. And you know, sometimes it's, I just want to do this thing. Like right here is the peak of my career and I want to stay here. And, and other times it's, oh, I don't know. I've never thought about that. And, and, and sometimes it's, oh, I want to have your job one of these days, which awesome. That's a huge win, right? Let me, let's talk about it and let's figure out how to teach you all these things so that you can start to practice it and see what it's like to sit in my chair um, and then make sure that's really what you want. Because the last thing you want is to promote somebody into a leadership role and then have them hate it, right? That's just, it, it's it, it's bad. It, everything goes bad and it's, it's very expensive for the company. Yeah. Yeah, especially at scale. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. especially in tech. You no, know, right. One wrong yeah. semicolon misplacing the code, as we saw recently yeah. with what? What was it? CrowdStrike? Like all these airplanes and yeah. nothing could nothing yeah. could fly. <laughs> yeah, everything that just was, shut off. Right. It's crazy that you know it, it wasn't even. It, it was. It's an intrusion security software, but it has such deep hooks into the operating system that everything dies, right? Which I've been, I've been reading some analysis of that and, and people are like, okay, we may have gone a little bit too far in, down this road, you know? And you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like the equivalent of, of your car doesn't start so your heart stops beating, you know? It's like, whoops, that might've been a bad call, yeah. Yeah. Did you find anything like interesting through your research in that uh what is it? What what would be a word like uh calamity? A calamity yeah, of an event? Um the, the big thing was that their QA process wasn't nearly good enough. QA meaning like, quality assurance. Quality assurance, okay. Yeah. So they, they should have been, you know, considering how tied into to under the hood they are on servers, they should have had a lot of different quality assurance testing happen, a very deep stack of that uh, before they actually started rolling out the, the uh, software update. Uh, you know, like, like I've done a lot of software updates over the years, you know, in terms of, you know, my team's rolling stuff out. And we we kind of had that philosophy like the medical world of first do no harm and and we're not perfect but we also were very diligent um and the idea that you could roll out something and have that this level of problem means that their process has a hole in it and and they need to solve that yeah. Have you ever experienced anything close to that magnitude in your career? Like at any place you've worked, you don't have to name, but like, like what, like people are like, oh, like my, this website's down. People don't understand the amount of work that goes into it to get that website yeah. back up, let alone to get all these airplanes back in the air. Right, right. That's a whole other level of problem is getting you, because you've got scheduling of all these airplanes with the FAA, right? Like there's a whole level of complexity on top of, you know, what's going on. Now, the, the good news is the FAA has had lots of different kinds of calamities happen over the years where, you know, the weather happens, right? And they have to shut down an airport. And so they, they have processes in place. Um, for us, God, I'm trying to like, you know, horrible things. Um, I mean, this I is almost like the blue screen of death. Yeah. So... You know, years. One of the first companies that I worked at. You know, I've been doing this for a while. And back then, when I started, we actually had our servers in our office, because um, data centers didn't exist back then. And we uh, we had 
on a weekend, a cleaning lady unplugged our server. <laughs> yeah, just unplugged it from the wall, didn't <laughs> plug it back in again, and left. And uh, unfortunately, we were most of the team was out of town um, at a conference, and we were in Vegas. And as we realized what had happened, I was trying to get on an airplane to fly back just to plug it in. Um, and we found one of the guys on the team who who was still in town and uh and we got him to to go to the office and like plug it back in and you know everything came back up again right we were down for like four hours maybe five hours something like that you know it wasn't the end of the world um but that was one of those you know it's like a tiny little thing that we'd never considered we'd never thought the cleaning lady would would unplug the server we just it just wasn't a thing right um you know years later i was at a company where the payment processor shut us off mm -hmm. um and we we couldn't do we we couldn't take money in um and we were doing a lot of volume and it was it was a, a like we were one of their larger customers it was just a mix up on their side um for some unknown reason, um, somebody thought that we had quit doing business with them and it had just shut us off, right? Like human error, every, you know, it was just, a, and we were like, okay, this is like every minute that goes by, that's tens of thousands of dollars that were, and frustrated customers even worse, you know, people that want to give us money and they can't. Um, and then, you know, with Heart, the last company that I, last startup that I did, um, we discovered that what we thought was going to be a solution that would scale well, it, it wouldn't handle um, when we had 10,000 simultaneous users. Um, 10,000 or 10,000 in one? Um, 10,000 plus or minus a few hundred. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had, you know, we were, we were doing all of our testing, you know, we were having like tens or, you know, 100 people in the system. And then we one day had a couple of school districts all start using the system at the exact same time. And so literally 10,000 students tried to log in all at the same time. And uh, the system just couldn't handle it. And uh, it, it took me a while to figure out how to re-architect the system to, to scale it so it would, it would actually handle what we were doing. Um, that was pretty frustrating. Uh, How long does a problem like that take to, for you to solve? Um, that one took me, God, I want to say like a month. Oh. Yeah. A month in technology time is like, it was forever. forever. Yeah. Yeah. And part of the problem was I couldn't just magically get 10,000 people to come into the system. Right. So, you know, we went to the hosting guys and we're like, hey, we just crashed all crashed the servers, WTF. And they said, okay, we'll put you on the, you know, the, the biggest stuff we've got. Um, the next week it happened again. And by then I was already talking with uh, a friend of mine who's a really good sysadmin about, okay, what do I do? And he said, oh, well, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to move everything to AWS monitor your own code base and I'll help you get it set up. And so we ended up moving everything to AWS and setting up um, clusters, both for the front end, for the business logic and the database on the back end. Um, and once we did that, everything was fine. But the, you know, I was like on the edge of my seat the whole time like, how can I be sure this is actually going to work? Um, and, uh, you know, it's just one of those learning experiences, you know, you just be like, oh my God, I can't. And, and, you know, we talked to people like, oh, you can handle 10,000 users. And we said, well, here's exactly what we're doing. And they were like, oh yeah, no, you can't, you know, um, you've, you've got to go to the, you've got to go and, and scale up on the, on the, the, the the stuff that we implemented the way we did it worked really well but apparently it's very uncommon mm. um so it was a good learning experience all the way around
It reminds me of when the fan in my laptop stopped working. Oh, no. And I brought it in to someone to fix it because I didn't want to deal with it. And he goes, oh, man, you just need a new fan. Just go on eBay. Here's the part. Buy it. You already got all the tools because I bought all like the computer tools because I've changed a hard drive a couple times. Something simple that you don't have right, to pay right. like hundreds of dollars to do. Now with YouTube, you can just YouTube it. But yeah, what he failed yeah. to tell me was to uh, take the battery out first. Oh. So I crashed the entire computer. Oh, no. Even though oh. I was willing to pay this person to do it, he's like, no, man, this is easy. I was like, okay. He's like, just yeah. you know, here's the part, unscrew the fan. He's. Like, I brought it back in and go, hey, man, I did exactly what you told me to. He goes, did you take the battery out first? I was like, you didn't say that. So yeah, entire computer yeah. crash. However, that's a very small problem compared to what you had to deal with. Such as, yeah. all right, let's uh, we'll pay more money. We'll get on the top of the notch server. All right, that fails. Now what? Uh, right. I don't know. Let's go all the way to square one, um, and then work day and night for a month to figure it out. Yeah, it was a. Uh... It was, it was an interesting challenge. Luckily, you know, cause I've been doing this for a while. I know people that I can, you know, reach out to and go, Hey, I need some help. Can I get you for on the phone for 10 minutes? Um, and, and, you know, they, they know stuff, right? That's why networking is so important. For yeah. sure. And you may, you mentioned AWS. Yeah. People oh, see this all the time on like, I think they do stuff like the NFL. Yeah. And whatnot, like their yeah. Amazon analytics. When did when did Amazon get into this game? Like, because they like sneak all of a sudden you start to see commercials for it, but they like did it almost like stealthy, <laughs> like all this um, AWS things. Like, because it started with books and then selling things, and then now they're doing all this like cloud stuff that people don't understand. Right. right. Um, I'm gonna say 15 years ago. Oh wow. Yeah, it's it's been so, and. I was at a startup that got in super early to AWS. Um, we kind of got into their beta program because one of the co-founders of the company was friends with the guy who at that time was spearheading getting AWS off the ground. Um, and so he, you know, one day came to me and said, Hey, Bill, we're doing this new thing. It's all virtual servers. And at that point in time, I was used to having a data center where I could walk in and point to the box and go, that's us, right? You know, we've got some number of boxes in a, in a, in a data center. And he's like, oh, it's all virtual now. And I was terrified because, because, you know, it's like, it's a whole new thing, right? And I'm like, it's not real, it's virtual. And how well does that work and how stable and like, you know, every fear you could possibly have when there's a brand new technology and, and they didn't have any publicity about it. Um, and everything was command line. Like now they've got this really beautiful web interface. You can go in and you have all these choices. Back then it was uh, all Unix command line stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I'll figure it out, you know? And, uh, and we did. But, when, you know, we were doing it and they didn't charge us for it. It was free mm. because we were part of their early, adopters. Their early beta testers, right? Their early adopters. And so like everything we did, we never got it. We never had a bill for it. It was, it was just, you know, basically they were monitoring everything we were doing. Like it's kind of like training AI. We were training them on real world, what somebody would actually be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we actually, one of the things that happened was we were, we were doing a bunch of work with um, businesses in Asia at the time. And what we found was that the AWS in California had too much latency. And so one of the reasons that um, they, one of the reasons they did a data center, I think in Hong Kong, um, and this is like way back when, when it was brand new, was because we told them we, we, we couldn't work because it, it just took way too long. Um, latency was way too bad for folks in Asia to hit the data centers here in, Cal in uh, I think at that time, the one we were using was in Washington. Um, 
but that was one of their, you know, they used us for data points. So like uh, if these servers are not, are they still servers, like physical servers, but somewhere else, like how, how does that work? Cause most people don't know how any of this yeah. so operates. The that, yeah. The way that it works is there's a, um, there's been what they call virtualization mm -hmm. software around for quite a while now. You can, so they, you know, they call them virtual machines. Um, and so on, even on your laptop, there's software you can install. So you can, you can have multiple virtual, virtual machines. And so, you know, you could be running in parallel an, a virtual windows box, um, a couple different flavors of Unix and even a Mac on your laptop or on your desktop machine or whatever. Right. Uh, and so that's basically the idea is they've got a whole bunch of, of machines that have these virtual servers, servers on them. And now they're good enough. They can run the virtual server across multiple, multiple pieces of hardware. Are these like and, actual machines or? Yeah, no. Like so they've got, so what they've, it's this kind of crazy, you know, imagine you've got a hundred computers and, and they're all operating, you know, with however many terabytes of data and, and gigs of mm -hmm. RAM and you need a really small server, right? You just need something really small because you're running a small instance of WordPress. And so they, so you buy a virtual machine that's on one of those boxes that's 5% of the total available, whatever on the box, right? Um, but it's only 5% when you actually have traffic. And then it goes back down to zero, right? And so they can, um, they can basically overbook the server mm -hmm. um, and so there's a bunch of people on there right there's a whole bunch of other people that all have virtual machines somebody else comes along who says i need a big server right and now depending on the size they may actually have that your machine span multiple of those boxes to get you what you need right and and so it's this interesting well, what is it that we need to have our system run well? Um, you know, part of our experimentation back when we were really, when we were struggling with heart was we went with a big, we, we tried installing on one big virtual box and we couldn't do it. We had to actually do the clusters of smaller boxes um, because the, the number of connections that, that, the, that the server could handle was a limiting factor. So it was like, you know, kind of into the weeds of how does this stuff work and then figuring out what the scale points are. Um, and that up, and, and that happens for everybody now. You know, this is why DevOps is so important is the DevOps guys can, can bridge that gap and say, oh, wait a minute, because of the way we work, we need a whole bunch of small boxes rather than one big one. Does this have any relation to the NVIDIA chips that have been selling like hotcakes? Oh, the NVIDIA chips? The, they're, those are running, um, from what I know, it's, it's all AI-related stuff or mostly mm -hmm. AI-related stuff. And because AI is very, very memory-intensive and those are they're, they're big memory stuff, um, it, it's a... I, I want to say niche market, kind of. Yeah. 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 That's what I've been trying to tell people. They're like, yo, are you buying NVIDIA? Like, it's skyrocketing and this and that. I'm like, you know, I don't know. First of all, I don't know enough about it to make a determination. All I know is they make chips. And I know from history and technology, if you don't diversify your product line and someone makes better chips, now all of a sudden you're out of business. <laughs> Right, right, and uh, and also is, you know, with with Moore's law, someone's going to come up with better, faster, cheaper, and and they're going to lose their advantage. You now, right, because like the companies yeah. buying these chips are like your Amazons, your Google, right, Tesla, right. Uh, Meta, uh, Apple, and all those companies have really smart people. They get their right. hands on some chips. All of a sudden, now they're like, oh, that's how they did it. Right. You're, you're just right. missing this one little piece of the our thought process. That one little difference can make 
technology, the difference between being dial up internet and the internet that we have now. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, all those companies have, um, have had in-house chip fab operations and, you know, Apple makes their own chips now, right? Yeah. They, they get off of Intel. Yeah. They're doing M uh, I think M three or four is the, is the latest. So, you know, they can easily replicate that and it's core to their, to their vertical integration. Um, Amazon makes lots of stuff that has chips in it. And if they're not fabbing their own chips, they can next week. Um, and it's the same thing for Meta. And, and so, and there's, there's a bunch of other third party companies out there that I'm sure just jumping all over this, trying to build a better mousetrap. Yeah. Um, and, you know, people tend to forget that there's, there's, there's these great rises, but there's also pretty rapid falls um, in tech. And, and then you forget about them. Yeah. You know? We had a, we had someone else who was in the tech like you, uh, Mike Seidel. And I mentioned him, I was like, Mike, do you remember uh, Sun Microsystems? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, they were, everybody thought they were amazing and their, you know, stock was going up and they were the darling and, and then they, not anymore, you know? Yeah. Cause um, wasn't like Hewlett Packard more valuable than Microsoft at one point too. Yeah. Yeah. Because of their, they came out like the laser printer and they're like, Oh, this is like the next huge thing. And then I think, I think they took the company. Was it Dell? It was either Dell or HP or maybe both. I think Dell went private and it, maybe it's not private anymore. Then HP did some sort of restructure of some sort yeah, at some multiple, point. HP's had multiple restructures. Dell interestingly acquired um, they acquired a big storage company. Let's see if I can find it real fast. Um, and now a ton of their revenue comes from selling storage devices. Is it uh, SecureWorks, Moogsoft, EMC? EMC, yeah. Yep. Got it. That um, happened um, yeah. almost 10 years ago. Yeah, that's a big cash cow for them. And they smartly didn't wrap it into the Dell brand because they knew it's, you know, it's two completely different audiences and it would be, it would be super confusing. Uh, so that, that was really smart that they did that. But yeah, there's the, the tech space evolves so fast and there's so few companies that have had the longevity you know, Microsoft and Apple are the are, in in my mind, the two champions of of business longevity in tech, um, because they're very specifically tech companies. Um, Amazon leverages tech; they're not known for their tech, right? Uh, and you know, after Microsoft and Apple, it's kind of like who's number three. Um, I don't, I don't know. Google? Maybe. No, well, Google doesn't build tech. Cisco, maybe, like probably a networking company. Palo Alto. Palo Alto Networks. Yeah, those guys. Mm -hmm. um, they've been around for quite a while. Uh, and, and anybody that's making switches and networking gear. But those aren't household names, right? You know, you just, most people, if you go, oh, yeah, you know, Palo Alto Networks, they're like, who? Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's plenty of technology companies out there that have been around just as long as those others that you mentioned have done very, very well from an investment standpoint, but they just don't get the recognition the others do because the right. others uh, spend a lot of money to get their name in front of people. Right, right. And I think it's, you know, consumer brand versus B2B. Mm -hmm. And so the consumer brands are spending, they're spending money on marketing because they want uh, 10 million customers versus the B2B that wants only 10,000, right? But, you know, those 10,000 are spending millions of dollars every year versus, you know, Apple wants 500 bucks from you every year, right? 
whole, completely different kind of a, of a scale model. Right. Yeah. yeah. Where is um, technology in my mind is basically a consumer staple now, like without technology, you cannot, oh, yeah. you cannot operate in this day and age. And a lot of people I talk to in the investment world, the investment world still teaches people like, Hey, technology is super risky. Like you want to, you know, make sure you don't go too far in the tech, but technology, if I tell you, Bill, like you go out in the world without your phone, like how, how well are you going to be able to operate in that world compared to if you have that phone? Right. So right. with everything that's going on, especially with AI, which AI has been around since IBM started creating it like in the fifties or sixties, I believe. So it's been around for a long time. Right. Right. Is this an, a net positive or net negative or neutral? Like what are your thoughts being in the tech space for as long as you have? Um, like people out there might be thinking like Judgment Day, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right, right. So I think, so, so I look for different data inputs, right? And and one of the data inputs, just because I've been working in the mental health education space for the last five years, is what happens with people's mental health. And unfortunately, and there's a ton of data now on this, the rise of our technology has had a parallel drop in our mental health. Mm -hmm. And so that's a problem, right? Um, that's a real problem. And I, the other thing I notice is that when you get out of urban and suburban environments and you get into rural environments, um, you get into into more blue collar environments, not nearly as many mental health problems, and also not nearly as much reliance on the tech. Right, right. That's the other part, um, because there's still tech just hasn't really gone into those places in in um, at scale. Right, See, people are still driving diesel tractors. Um, they don't trust the electric tractors because the batteries don't last long enough. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're, they're still way too new to the game. Um, and a lot of people are using old, old stuff, you know, it's equipment that lasts for decades. And so why would I spend the money to experiment with a new technology thing? when I've got this reliable and it's my food chain, right? It's super primitive. Um, and at the same time, those people have a lot of self-confidence because they know how to do stuff, right? Like, you know, as, as unusual as it may sound, they know how to drive a tractor when they're seven years old and, you know, they've been hunting and fishing and raising chickens and, seeing animals slaughtered and harvesting, like all that stuff, um, either their own family or aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, next door neighbors are doing all that stuff. And they just have a very different appreciation of the world. And, and it's without the tech. And, and so I think like I'm, you know, I have this side project working on a regenerative farm. Um, and so I'm, every weekend I get to be hanging out with people like this. And I, I'm like, Oh, I really appreciate that the lack of tech is actually a benefit. Yeah. Totally. So I, I, you know, like I'm pushing my kids to be less tech focused and more learn pragmatic skills. Um, so you can solve problems. For sure. Yeah, that problem solving piece is a skill that technology can't help you learn. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, to a degree, you know, you're talking about using Google to figure out how to do something. Even with that, it's a muscle to want to take on solving, the, to actually do the work of solving the problem. And, and I've I started an accidental experiment with my younger son 
um, he, uh, he, he wrecked his car a couple of years ago. And I said, we're not going to insurance it and buy you another one. You're going to fix it. And I used to be a mechanic. And so I looked at the car and I'm like, there's nothing permanently wrong with it. That's, you know, horrible. Everything here is a bolt on part. You're going to do all the work. And fortunately his mom backed me up on this. And so that made it really easy. Um, he started off being really apprehensive and like, I don't know what to do. And, and, you know, me giving him very detailed step-by-step -step instructions and only one at a time because he couldn't handle more. And, you know, fast forward two years, uh, he's completely running his own problem solving stuff. And he comes to me when he gets stuck, but he's got all the confidence in the world to go jump into things. And there's a bunch of stuff. He's just doing it. Right. Um, and it's because he's been practicing problem solving. You know, he's doing the work, he's getting the reps in. He's comfortable that he can solve a problem and he doesn't get emotionally upset when he can't figure it out in five minutes. He's like, oh, okay, it's gonna take more time. Okay, no big deal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and through that, the, you know, the children and the kids are still learning. They're going to figure out like, hey, like I can solve these problems. But sometimes, you know, there's things that I've tried. And no matter how hard I work, no matter how many hours I put into it, I'm just not going to be able to fix it. And that's OK, too, because we all have our right. strengths. We all have our weaknesses. And that seems like what you've done is identifying the strengths and weaknesses with the teams that you built and making sure you put the right people in the right seat so that they're successful. Yeah, yeah, it's. It's that, and also there's this other nuance that is, where do you want to go, right? And, and maybe counterintuitively, if you are in this seat, but you really like to get to that seat, and I'm like, okay, cool, let's figure out how to help you make that happen. For some period of time, you do more better work in the original seat as you're working on transitioning, right? Plus, I don't lose you and your knowledge when you move to the new seat, right? Unless you move out of the company. Um, and I try to keep people in the company and let them move around to different places. That, that level of, I guess, autonomy that, that you know, to give people to support that, um, they like it, they trust me more, and they work harder because it's, it's intrinsic motivation. They're like, oh my God, there's this carrot, I want it. And I'm just facilitating, you know? And, and, and away they go, yeah. For sure. A lot of people don't know that sometimes passing the ball is the best way to get the ball in the basket. Oh, so, totally. For sure. Bill, super appreciate you having on. Love everything that you, you had. And uh, we'll see everyone next time. Bye everyone.